I, I wanted to bring Tyrone along as one of our master coaches. And Tyrone over the years has gotten some phenomenal results. And recently he coached a fellow by the name of Chris. And Chris won everything, everything. He won seven comps. And I actually think it's one of the best transformations Tyrone's ever helped a client produce here. And really because Chris came in, a guy who had a training base, he'd been training for a few years, but he didn't look like he looked on, like the way he looked when he came in six months ago, to the way he looks now, they're, they're two different humans. And, you know, Tyrone did, he did a lot. You know, when we talk about going over and above for a client and the magic recipe, I think it was a beautiful transformation. So let's welcome Tyrone, first of all. Hi, Tyrone. How are you today? Hi, Mark. I'm good. Hello, everyone. Hello. So you had Chris. So tell us a little bit about Chris. Chris, well, a bit about Chris. So Chris walked in. He'd had coaches before, basically swapped me before, but he'd coaches before. He owns two businesses. He's a pastry chef, works a shit ton of hours, stress levels are through the roof. Yeah, he's had a few coaches before and basically he's been obsessed with doing bodybuilding comps for years. He brought me like a, it was like a scrapbook. <laughs> and it, was, it was his dream, it was his dream. He wanted to get up on stage, but he basically felt like he was just on the hamster wheel going round and round. So yeah, that was, that was the goal. He basically so said to in, in short, he was the guy that See someone do it, does a comp. He's like, I want to do this. And year after year after year, disappointed because he never, never really was able to. Correct. Yeah. So you're working with kind of a blank canvas. So pretty compliant or very compliant? How would you describe his compliance? Yeah, he was, he was willing to do whatever it took. But at the same time, there were different parameters. Like he could only train four days a week. Right. So it wasn't- Because of work. Because of work. Yeah. There were a lot of things, a lot of parameters that we had to work on with work and stress and um, stress levels and things like yep. that. But at the same time, I, we guided a deal where I said to him, I said, all right, we can do four days a week now, but once you do this comp, we put, we put parameters in place. So we not only did we look for, we set a goal for a comp date, but then we set a goal for a second comp, which is next year. So October next year. So we, we set like a three year goal. So with that, if I interrupt, um, I imagine a client who's had a lot of disappointment like this has some trust issues. As in, will the plan work for me? Did you get any of that for him? Or did you get the trust immediately? This is how I gain trust. Okay, so for our podcast listeners, Tyrone's just uh, I set, I set up, up a, a spreadsheet that is very, very detailed. So I just want to talk us through this spreadsheet a bit so the guys in the audience and at home listening to this can uh, so, get an idea. Yeah, so I set up, this is for, I mainly use for, for comp prep and you can use for anybody, but I, this is how I, I set up comp prep and, and, and photo shoot clients. And I said to him, this is the date. This is where we need to work back from. So we worked from 7th of April. And basically I said to him, uh, you need to put on weight before you can compete. And I give people the option. Especially so just to pause you on a few things. You said to him, you need to put on weight before you compete. I imagine a lot of people who come in for comp, they think the process is I'm just going to get lean. Yeah, correct. What was, what was his response to, hey, I'm gonna, you're going to put on weight? Well, I give people the ultimatum. I'm like, right. do you want to compete or you want to be competitive? Anybody can compete. You can get on right now, but you're going to look like shit and you're not going to be competitive and you're going to turn around and you're going to go, oh, I probably should have done things differently. So that's the option I give people. Do you want to compete or do you want to be competitive? So you, sh you showed him the, the, vid the, the, the roadmap. Yes. And the way you developed trust was you're showing him the roadmap and you, you're, you're backing up what you're saying with data of this is what we're going to track mm -hmm. and this is how we're going to do it. And yeah. this is what this spreadsheet is. And this is what this spreadsheet is, yes. Right. So I then calculate on an, on, on average going, okay, this is where you're currently sitting from a body fat percentage. This is where I'm estimating you're probably going to go to. And this is where I want your weight to go to. Uh, I'm predicting your weight will go. So basically we got, he started at 77 kilos. I predicted he was going to go up to 84. He actually got up to 84.2. Pretty good prediction. So I based it on, we want to put on roughly 1% of body weight per month, right? And that's just based on the data and the research that we have at the moment. Then from there, I calculate how much weight we're going to need to lose from an estimation in order to get him stage lean. And that I estimated that he was going to need to be about 72 kilos. So I calculated backwards on how much body fat we need to, on how much weight we need to lose and how much time it was going to take. Now with Chris, we, I took relatively conservative approach of half a kilo a week, whereas some people we, I might take an approach of a bit more aggressive at the start and then back it off as they get leaner to try and preserve as much lean mass so, as possible. So with the weight, that you said he needs to put on. Mm. 
He, can we just go back to how much did he... So, he came in at... What was his total weight that he came in at? 77. 77. And at the end of that 77 build, he got up to 82.1. 80, 84. 84. So, he got up to... So, he put on some... some Size. Yeah, he put on some, yeah. some size. Yeah. And how long was that phase? That was from... So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think. That was probably about 11 weeks. 11 weeks. Okay. So, I just want to paint this out to the, to the, you know, the trainers here is client comes in, they think I'm going to have a body transformation in 12 weeks. And then Tyrone says, yes, you will have a body transformation, but probably not the one that you were expecting. We're going to do 12 weeks of building you up. We're going to put on what, seven, eight kilos yep. and in that time. And then we're going to talk about dieting you down. How does that sound? Would your client say yes or would they say no? If you paint the bigger picture, they're going to say yes, all right? So paint the bigger picture and then Tyrone puts them into the cutting phase. So the cutting phase, tell us about the expectations in the cutting phase. So with the cutting phase, this is where I get a bit more detailed. So with the build, I will leave things a bit more, not, not to chance, but I'll take things as they come. So I'll monitor weight and I'll monitor how much body fat they put on. So you can see here, Chris didn't get above 13% body fat. So I'll monitor that and then I'll increase calories periodically as they need to be with either, when either weight stagnates or they start getting leaner, et cetera, um, or they adapt and then I'll start increasing from there. Whereas when it comes to the actual cutting phase, right, I'm a bit more specific. So from the very beginning, Chris had his calories laid out all the way until the end, right? So you can see here, and then I, so I calculated it, I calculated his deficit all the way through. Now if you look at Chris, he actually didn't even go below a 20% deficit. Right. Because he was working and- Because he was working, because his output was so high, right? We didn't need to take him so that low. Let's talk about that for a second, but right? But he also so, trains hard. Yeah, he does. So what, when he came in, so original Chris, you know, the, the blank canvas, so to speak, what, what was he doing? What was his calories at? This is an indicator. Or was it sporadic? He was- No, his here. calorie, he had set calories. The biggest tweak that I made with Chris was just changing his macros around. Okay. He was on like, and this is what his old coach gave him, he was on like 127 grams of fat, couple hundred grams of carbs and I can't, it was like, I've got it written down, it was like 150 grams of uh, protein, yeah. And then, so basically what I did with Chris was, I first thing I did was I actually just rejigged his macros. And I got the interpretation. So this is the nutrition aspect. So in, in saying that calorie wise, it, are you saying it was somewhat the same from- From a calorie perspective, I kept them the same. From, yep. And all I did was rejig his macros. Now, so just so we have some kind of in, indicative data, I was talking yesterday to the, to the folks about how we build someone's calories up over time. So did he start, I don't know, let's say when he, like week one, did he start, let's say at what, 1600 calories and then he got up to 2000, 3000? We got him, we got him as high as about 3000, 3200. 3000, 3200. And I would build him up probably about 200 calories. Every, every time he either maintained or got leaner, I'd build him up. So about 200 calories you, you built him out to say 3,000, 3,300, yep. just rounded up. What was, um, what was, but what did he, did he start at 3,300? No, he started about, I think about 2,200. 2,200. So you see how we're building people's nutrition up. So he's, and that's what I was saying yesterday about how you have the theoretical baseline and you have the actual baseline. And you really only know someone's actual baseline by testing and measuring because all calorie formulas are theoretical until they get tested. And as we found, you found with Chris, is that he actually required more calories than what you may have theorized or thought necessarily. And then you track his body fat and is, is this on track? And then you tweak. Correct, right? yeah. So you said um, he was on 127 grams of fat. Did you lower his fat to bring his carbs up? Yeah, that's all I did. I, and I think I put his protein up a little bit. So I went to about two, 2.5 grams per kilo. Um, and I brought his fats down to, I usually work people on, on fats of about 0.8 per gram of body weight, uh, 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight, and then I just fill the rest of them with carbs. Do you feel off lean, like how much lean muscle, like 0.25 grams of protein per lean gram? Just, off weight. just, like, just repeat the question for the audio. What was oh, it? Sorry, so um, are you going off their body weight or off their lean so muscle the, the, mass? So the question is, weight. are you going off their body weight or are you going off their lean yeah, muscle so, mass? So with protein, I just go off body weight. So off, off, off body weight. Off body weight. Yeah, easier. Yeah, it's easier. And most of the time, even with calories, I just go off body weight a lot of time too. Okay, so that's how you, you mapped out his nutrition. Now, what was the thought process behind? So you, you, we had a phase, 12 weeks, essentially 11 weeks. We're going to build him up. You've put on eight kilos now. Mm. He's got mass on him. How much did he put on body fat? Yeah, he went from 
And so he no, started- Notice just on that, right? Notice how casual Tyrone was like, yeah, you put on body fat, no stress. It's easy. Yeah, okay, so you put on, how much body fat did he put on? Uh, 3%. Right, so he, how, he, how much muscle mass did he put on? Seven kilos. Seven kilos, right? So you, the phrase there, obviously with a client, is you give me 3% body fat, I give you seven kilos of muscle. Do you want to make the trade? Some clients will be like, no, but hang on, wait, you've got seven kilos of muscle, which is going to change the way you look completely. So if you are wanting to compete and have a high level transformation, you need to make this, this trade. So yeah, continue, we're going to have a- a good, a, good, a good way I like to phrase it is for people to envision them putting on seven kilos, it's like, imagine you go to the shop, you buy seven kilos of chicken breast, slap that on your body, how do you think you're going to look? And they go, oh wow, that's a lot, like yeah, that's a lot, seven kilos is a lot. But at the same time, you also just you also just need to back it up and go. Well, you're not going to put on as much lean mass if you continue doing what you've been doing, right? There's so much research to show that you need to put on a little bit of body fat for especially trained individuals in order to put on that lean mass. Obviously, you don't want to put on put on too much because then you're just putting on more fat than lean mass. But you want to put it on incremental time, and that's why breaking up and going. Okay, you we're going to work on one percent a month of your body weight. So when it did come down to cutting, what was his body fat starting out? Uh, 13. So he got to 13 and he actually dropped pretty quickly. And you can see incrementally we got down to, oh, so he got, sorry, he got 12.2 and we, no, 13. And then he got down to 11 and a half. We basically got, then over incrementally. So what, what was his body fat when he started the journey? 10. 10. So he, he went from 10 to 13.3, but yep. put on a lot of weight, yep. good weight. Uh, and then when it was time to diet, I almost see like almost instantly he got to 11.7 and then within a couple of weeks, he was back at 10 and then broke 9.7. He went 11.5. Uh, that looks like four or five weeks. Where's that? You went, you went from 12.2 to 9.7. No, that's, that's what I predicted. He was actually at 13. Oh, he was at 13. And then he went to 11 and a half in a week. Right. From the first week so of diet. You say Chris is more naturally ectomorphic? Yeah. So he's, right. he's very tall. He's like... 6'3". Yeah, long levers. Long levers. Yeah, cl that, classic that, ectomorphic yeah. physique. So we'll, we'll drop right weight pretty which is, rapidly. Which is which is also the reason why I looked at him when he first came in. and I, I looked at the ratio of his macros and just from experience, I knew that he would do, would do a lot better high carb. He was eating like a mes uh, endo. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. An, an, and eating like an endo. Endo, endo ectomorphic physique is generally going to do better with high fat, high protein, low carb. Your ectomorphics is always going to do better with much higher carb, moderate protein, moderate fat, for sure. So, so speaking about the diet, right? Was it six meals? Was it five meals? Three meals? How would you map that that side of things out? I mean, he said you said he was already tracking, he was already doing things. So basically, was it more? more was the, and what was the feedback? Was it more food than he expected? So much more food. So much more food than he expected. So much more food. Yeah. Um, it got to the point like you need to see here. Like I gave Chris the option of some cereal because you just couldn't fit the food in, and this is. This is on 2,600 calories. So let me just pause there, right? So like he comes in, he's doing what he's doing, right? Um, this is what I'm doing. Do you change everything from day one? Are you changing everything slowly? Are you like, no, this is how it's going to be from today? Like what's the process? I will, and I do the same thing with everybody. I take, with, take what they've got and I make the smallest amount of adjustments possible. If someone's eating two meals, I will say to them, can you eat three? Because the, the, the gap that you have in between your meals is going to be large and you're going to start to get hungry. By the time you start to get hungry, right, you're just going to start looking for food. The hungrier you are, the poorer choices you're going so, to make. So what, how many meals did he start up at? Chris was already on four. He was on four. So you went into five? No. You kept him four. at four? We kept him at four. Kept him at four. And then what did you do? So was he, you just simply eating too much fat and you just changed the macros around? Just changed the macros around, gave him, just, yeah, just changed the macros around uh, and gave him less fat, more carbs, and then it ended up being, he was already having some intra-workout carbs, which I kept, and then I just gave him the option between like, intro carbs on a training day and then a cereal on an on day. So like day. every week we adding food? Is that how you went? Like measure, add food, measure, measure add, add food. food. Measure, add food. Yeah, and what were your ads? So how did you add? How did you, so but was it like a macrogram or was it a food serving? How did I you would, think about that? I would go with uh, a calorie. So I'd add on roughly 200 calories at a time. Yep. And I'd break that down to how many macrograms of carbs. Right. And then I would split that up and I would talk to Chris. Like, so, okay, I, well, let's add some more food. Where can you fit more food? Where are you hungry? What's easiest? And then generally be either, first I'd focus either around training first, uh, before and after training, and then I'd focus in the evening to help with sleep. Uh, and then basically wherever else was easiest for him to get it in. And what was his carb of choice, so to speak, or your carb of choice? So I generally give everyone the options um, between white potato, sweet potato, colored rice or white rice. Um, and then depending on how they handle gluten, 
Um, it'll either be gluten-free pasta or normal pasta, and then I give them a choice. So it depends on the person as well. If they like choice and they don't like eating the same thing every day, like Chris had very, very good taste buds, so he liked a bit of variation. So I gave him the choice between sweet potato, white potato, rice, and pasta. Now, I know there's other clients you've had, Cristiano comes to mind, where they haven't been able to eat the amount of carbs that they've needed and you've done things like sorbet, lollies. Do you have a stance on like, let's say for example, Chris is like, oh, Tyrone, well, I mean, there's two instances, right? There's instance one, which is Tyrone, I just can't eat it anymore. And you might use like the maple syrups, the honeys, the sorbet, or there could be, you know, I really like lollies. Can you include lollies? I, we, I, or, I, or, or quote unquote, like junky type of food. What's your stance there? Yes, to an extent. So there needs to be a base, and I like that 80 to 90% base of whole nutritious foods, and then you can add little bits on top that are processed foods if you have the calories to go, the calories spent. I don't like it if someone's dieting, because yes and no. If someone's dieting and they don't have enough calories to spare, I'm like, it's like buying a Gucci bag when you haven't got your lights on at home, right? Don't spend your calories on the crap when you're not looking after the bills. So you gotta keep things from a nutrition, a micro, a macro and a micro, micronutrient perspective upheld before you can add on the, the glue, nice glittery thing. Yeah. Because calories are gonna determine how you, what you weigh, the macro is gonna determine how you look at that weight, and the micronutrients are gonna determine how you feel at that weight. Now that's not to say, obviously for comp prep, when you're dieting, there's gonna be a certain point where you're just gonna feel like crap because you're so lean but we want to look after a micronutrient level as much as we can. Uh, what was the lowest that he went to in terms of calories? 23, 21, 2100. 2100, which is uh, by a lot of coaches standards, pretty high still. <laughs> well, from your perspective, he was higher than I was. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> we were right. competing at the same time and he yeah. had about yeah. 600 more calories than me. And So I what was, was his weight? So just so we get a, a real good snapshot, he started at, I think you said 77? 77. And about 10% body fat. Yeah. And what did he finish up on in terms of like at his pre-show? Uh, 70, 72 kilos. 72 kilos. Right. So he lost about five kilos overall. Yeah. But put on what was the lean muscle mass? Uh, he, he put on um, a couple of kilos of lean mass in the end. Right. Um, so so quite, quite significant change. So can we just see, so show the folks like a before and after photo side by side so you can see. So the, that was before. This you, was... Yes, Tomo, while we get that up, what was the, the question? When you're um, doing the, that initial build phase, do you have a rule of thumb for the ratio of body fat to lean mass that you're looking at? I'm just going to repeat the question for the audio. Um, so when you're doing, if I get the question right, when you're doing a rebuild phase, do you have a ratio of body fat increase to lean muscle mass increase? I, I give people like a top end. And I'm like, okay, we don't want to exceed this percentage of body fat, given the amount of time that we have or need to bring you back down. So for Chris, it was 13% because I said to him, we need to get to you about 3% body fat to get on stage. So I've got 10% to play with and I need, I've got 10% to lose. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the week before, this is the week of his first comp. Do you have the photo where you took here, where the lighting was a bit better or any of him on stage where you can show the folks? Yeah. No? Yeah. Oh, you? Yeah. Bring, bring those up. Um, questions around this, yes. So we use skin folds. So we use the BioSig 12 site skin fold test. That honestly is the most informative measurement tool that you'll find, skin folds. And again, the reason as I spoke yesterday about is we're able to ascertain, because every, every site corresponds to a different hormone and something else that's going on. And if you understand the patterns of what's going on, it's, it's data. It's not to say that like, let's say, you know, a high umbilical indicates high stress and like that's it, you know, you've got high stress. It's not to say it's like correlation is causation, but you know, there are, there are patterns, let's say for example, if you've been tracking the same way and let's say your calf and tricep go up, that is a telltale sign and everything else stays the same. That's a telltale sign of overtraining. So we're able to tell through skin folds indicative of a bigger story that's happening to be able to manage the athlete better because your skin folds will also tell you indicators of overtraining. That's why I'm, I'm huge on making sure we have a whole assessment criteria here for at, at Enterprise where you know every trainer here will do training for you know, sometimes weeks if not months on being proficient at the skin fold testing they'll pass with james and then to see clients they also need to pass with me and once they pass we can go yep stamp of approval you can now assess clients because 
there, there, is, there is a way to do it. You want to be, you want to be checked off. And it's just, it's just a great tool. Um, and it's, it's one where I don't think we'd be able to get the same level of information and feedback from our clients if we didn't use it. So if, you're, if we're not here and we don't have someone like you to run by, like how would you recommend it? If you say that it does take a lot of training, mm -hmm. how would you start tracking that now? Uh, learn, learn, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so I've got all the videos up on YouTube. So I do have all the videos up on YouTube, and then it's like, well, when you, you book your time here, uh, you know, you come down, we, we can assess you and, and show you one on one, which you, you've done before. Um, yeah, and then and, and then really like polish up on those skills and, and learn it. I, I, you know, for me to learn it, I learned it from Charles, and I went all around the world and Australia multiple times just to get time with him, and that's how I learned it because I didn't have anyone local to hey, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. So I, I had to go spend a lot of time with him. So yeah, and look, I'd say that investment for me has been definitely uh, well worth it. And um, you've made the Skinfold videos available freely on YouTube, so you can um, check them out and, and look at the reviews and all that. They've been there for a little while. But other than that, look, uh, taking measurements, yeah, measurements is good, but it's not as exact, right? It's, it's you're still not getting Photos are good, but I don't get the feedback of, did your calf go up? Because so calf correlates to sleep. Fat percentage as well. Yep. Skinfold shows you body fat, but site specific. Yeah, it's, it's site specific. It's 12 sites. It's just a lot of data that it gives you. If you understand the data, um, then you can make a lot of better changes. It's honestly like, in terms of Charles Poliquin's contribution to the world of strength and conditioning and body, body transformation, the, the biosignature, I think, is one of the biggest contributions. It was kind of poo-pooed for a long time because Charles did make a lot of very big claims about how, you know, it was a, not necessarily equivalent, but the claims on around what it could tell about people's hormones. So, you know, like again, a low tricep indicates high testosterone, for example. And it is an indicator, but again, correlation isn't causation. Um, it's only indicative data. So I'm not gonna diagnose someone's hormones from a biosignature test, but as a body composition tool, it does give me data, which I can consider in relation to all the other data that I have, like the aura ring, heart variability, your training, your mood, your sex drive, your digestion, everything else you're telling me, it's data. The more data I have, the more I can understand the picture. That's why I like biosignature as a, as a tool and skin folds as a tool because it, it gives us lots and lots of data. Make sense? So then the question is, is there a replacement for it? You're not gonna like this answer. No, <laughs> there's not. It is what it is, right? Um, you know, the, the body scan testers and all that kind of stuff, the way to interpret, let's say even like a, again, because I'm, I'm not using the skin folds per se as just what your body fat is. I'm looking at the sites to be able to manage you as a client better as well. Makes sense. Yeah, it's data. It's data. data. Data is data, right? So like the more data I have, like, I mean, the, the, the alternative is that we get your bloods every week, which is impractical. Your bloods or like get, you know, like get biochemical information that's happening from you. And look, there are going to be tests developed in the future where, you know, you prick, you do a prick test and it tells you all your bloods and, you know, it, it, unbelievably in that analysis with AI and predicted it, that, that is in, in the pipe work, right? But it's not available today and it's super expensive and impractical to implement. So this is where the skin folds is non-invasive and very, very quick and cheap, free for me as a practitioner. Well, these guys as practitioners to be able to do with their client. It's part of the consult. It's part of the session. Yeah. If the client was going to get something that they could track, let's like, say an aura ring, I know that they are quite expensive. Like a secondary so, so the question is, if he was going to get a client to track something like an aura ring, again, what are, what are we trying to track? So there are a lot of wearables out there. I, I, I believe, well, I use aura ring. I can't speak to any of the others. I believe whoop is also pretty good. I've never used whoop. People who use whoop, they tell me that the benefit of whoop is that it's more about the community. So if you have all your clients on whoop, you can compare data with everyone. That's, they say that's the, the biggest benefit of Whoop. For me, I don't want to wear a band going to bed and I find the idea of wearing a band going to bed really annoying. The Aura Ring for me is personal preference. I like the data, the data is almost always spot on, always spot on. I get the data that I need and it's non-evasive. And that's the biggest thing is I use it because it's non-evasive. I can just wh whack it on and I don't have to think about it.
Do you wear it all the time? Or no, I don't wear it all the time. I actually hate wearing rings because you can see how big my fingers are and like I've got kind of cartoonishly big hands. Any type of things around my fingers, I just really don't like because I have the biggest, you know, the aura ring sizes, I have to get the biggest one, right? Because yeah, I've got cartoonishly big hands. So how, what was the total weeks to get that transformation? It's about, six, it's about six months. Uh, if we look here, 32, just over, seven months. Yeah. So, so if we just bring the before photo up and then the after, the one on stage. So that was, that's his- Before his, and after, and then that stage photo. So that's him on stage. You can see an incredible, incredible, incredible transformation of, of muscle mass, lean. Um, so Tyrone, let's talk about his training, right? What, was, what would you classify him as? Was he intermediate? Was he a beginner? Advanced? Um, he was an intermediate. Intermediate. He was an intermediate. So the way I look at it, so basically Chris got the pleasure of... Now, when you said to him he's an intermediate or the way you approached this, was that uh, was he bummed to hear that news? Did he think he was more advanced or was he... I, I, I made it really good. I actually said to him that he's one step ahead of most people that come in. Right. Um, and that was the fact that he could squat and he could deadlift. Great. Um, so he, he basically got skipped ahead a phase um, in what I normally So do. first program in, you've never trained him before. What is phase weeks one to week four, I'm assuming? What does yep. that look like? So for Chris, phase, uh, phases one to four. Reps, so schemes. First three phases, I'm usually pretty pretty set with most people. And I, um, so Chris went straight to number two, and that was six Which to eight. Which is advanced GPP? Advanced GPP. General preparation. So he went to six to eight, so he got the, he got back squats, uh, leg curls. So he's using a relative strength system relative so strength. for his A's. So yep. six to eight for his A's, yeah. And that was a, it was an upper lower split. Just, uh, what was the question over here? What, so you have advanced GPPs and then? So there's a, there's a, there's a beginner GPP, yeah. intermediate GPP, and more advanced GPP. Okay. So, so advanced GPP be more like you'd go into like deficit squats, back to the bars and stuff, is that what you That was when we, yeah, I would actually, one, it's more of a relative strength rep range, so uh, that functional hypertrophy, six to eight, the traditional functional, hyper, traditional functional hypertrophy rep range, that six to eight, mostly because people can actually put a bit of load behind it, right? Whereas that, the, the newbies, I, I really usually start them on that eight to 10 or eight to 12, just because they haven't got that strength to be able to go towards failure between six to eight reps. So in, pointless. we've been talking about this this morning. So basically the vector with beginners, you're using volume over load. When someone becomes more advanced, you can drop the volume a little bit, but you're using a bit of higher load. Make sense? So, so, yeah, so what Chris, we see here, phase one in summary, you've got six to eight reps, four sets as the primary. Yeah. And what, six exercises? Six exercises, four sets uh, on the primary, four sets on um, the secondary, and then three on the accessories. So up using a split. really basic compound exercises, nothing too fancy. All right, so let's let's move to, to phase two. Where, where, do we, where are we at with phase two? Phase two is actually quite similar, but we used more of a descending rep range. So we went to, so you can actually see exercises are pretty much the same. Right. But so, when you say pretty much the same, variation was slight. Like, did you go from a flat bench to an incline bench? Yeah. Things so like we went, this, we dumbbells went from to split, barbells. Split squat to a walking lunge. Right. So we're still single leg. Back so, squat was still the same, but he had a pause. Yeah. Um, leg curl went from two legs to two up, one down. Um, so if we just pause on that point, just to, 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 because I was talking about this yesterday, is the pattern is actually the same, but there is variance. And the variance could be dorsiflex to plantar flex. Correct. Uh, pronated to supinated. But you know, pronated chin up to supinated chin up, obviously pronated's harder, but the pattern fundamentally is still somewhat the same. Still it's still a vertical pull. Still a vertical pull. So we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel and, and doing much. But again, you're still using that functional hypertrophy rep range, getting yep. into a little bit of relative strength in that six, six rep range towards the ends. Yep. So you're pushing. So see how the progression is? That's what I was saying yesterday about when you write a plan, it can't be like, you know, he's gone from functional hypertrophy. He didn't go from functional hypertrophy to strength endurance in 13 reps, right, and above. He went from, the, the reps are starting to come down. Now, let's see what he does in phase three. What's phase three? Just so you can really start to understand how we plan out these reps. Phase three was actually quite similar. Yeah. So we went from eight, eight, six, six. I actually brought his volume down. Yep. Um, so instead of four sets on his primaries um, and his secondaries, I brought him down to three sets. Reason being was because Chris trains to failure. Yep. He doesn't need that extra volume. And it was pretty easy where we just, I use descending rep ranges quite a lot just to incorporate a variance in, in reps and actually increase the load. So he went to an 864. But at the same time, the way I like to do it is, so what he does for eight and six and four, 
he then, so his six reps on week one becomes his eight reps on week two. His four reps on week one becomes his six reps. So he's actually increasing the load so and you, getting stronger. So you're using time. basically linear, linear progression in terms of loading parameters. Correct. So yeah. that, that make, it very much makes sense. But again, I think I want to point out here, just so people are really understanding, is that the programming, you've, you started at basically six to eight, then moved to eight, eight, six, six. So he's getting into the heavier rep ranges. Mm -hmm. Then now phase three, you're doing what? Eight, eight, six, four. eight six, four. So now he's touching uh, relative strength Correct. rep ranges, yeah. but he's also building upon that. And the reason why you've brought down volume is because he's able to create enough damage inside the muscle and not needing extra volume because you're ramping on the load vector. So again, we spoke about this volume and load. You're pushing, you're pushing him towards higher loads and really making sure those sets count. And again, the what I was before, there's an inverse relationship between what? Sets and reps, and an inverse relationship between what else? Volume and repeating effort and intensity. Right? So yeah, it was all it was all actually very similar. The only thing so you will notice is this is where, so within phase three, I actually move things to a little bit to, it's a bit more undulating. So you can see on his first leg day, he went 864. And on his second leg day, after deadlifts, he went to a 1086. So the reps actually became, were a little bit higher on his second ones. So then you can but see- But that's his supplementary work too, because his primary was deadlifts. deadlifts. Six, yeah, four so by six. you've made a consideration for the posterior chain, obviously being the deadlifts being a lot more neural taxing, you've gone to a higher rep range on the supplementary work. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I'm not expecting to back up another four sets of four to six on the hack swap because he just be cooked after that. Yeah, really using the supplementary work as, as, as assistance. And then phase four is where I went into more of a, a daily undulating uh, periodization. So you can see- let's, let's talk about that too, right? You, you finish that thought and because I know we've got a question about daily undulating. So you can see here, so lower body one is the example. So on the hack squat, we went 12, 10, eight. And then he's basically high rep ranges, drop sets. So like 888 on the 888 on the leg extension. And then on his second lower body, he was deadlifting lower reps, six, six, four, leg curls were six to eight, um, eight to 10. So it was one, I had a, basically a, a high volume day and then a, a, lower, a lower volume day. So, and then I would use those. Let's just back up a sec, right? So it's just, cause I think I just missed it, right? So the yeah. high volume day was how many sets? Same, same amount of sets. Same amount of sets. But the just reps, the reps. Were So what were the reps differences? So 12, 10, eight, they were basically between 10 and 15. Right. And included intensifiers. Yep. And then the lower volume day was six and under. Right. So or you, you six had, and under had, for the primary and you, then eight You're and using under. very similar movement patterns as well? Yes, so yeah, he and, was still deadlifting. What, what was the purpose of you doing that? Because I didn't want to cook him too much. So this is, this is the point that I'm getting at, right? So we were talking yesterday about daily undulated periodization. And I, I feel personally, the, the thing with daily undulated periodization, I don't like it as a label because it's kind of a catch-all phrase that puts so many things in to a bucket. And really, I think when people say daily undulated periodization is what they're talking about is what you just touched on, which is fatigue management. Correct. And for the most part, gen prop clients don't need daily undulated periodization. Daily undulated periodization or fatigue management really is only consideration if someone is training, let's say at least four days a week or they're training three days a week and really, really hard. And maybe mm. their workouts are like two, three hours. And you're managing the, the basically the fatigue that is accumulated with the high amounts of volume that they're gonna do, say for example, example, a comp. So when we, we think about, that's why I don't like daily undulating as a frame. I like the vector or the understanding of how am I going to manage this person's fatigue because it gives me tangible things of how I'm going to bring up what I'm going to bring down, which is basically what you've done here with, with yeah. the volume. Yeah. You've given him a, a really super hard day, but you know it's a super hard day where he's going to be cooked, fried, nearly really demanding. Yep. He's, you're going to pair that with a lower day, a bit nicer, bit of recovery, perhaps higher reps, getting blood flushed back into the muscle, He's getting the the nut nutrients into the muscle, actually assists almost like active recovery in many ways, which has been shown very much so that it can speed up recovery um, by, by doing that and then assisting and facilitating more hypertrophy. Am right. I missing anything in that picture of, of when you talk about daily angelic periodization? No, the only other time that, I mean, like you said, it is very broad and like even myself, I use it in a variance of different ways and it's very client dependent. And we were speaking about this before where like, well, how do you use it? There's a, it depends. So for Chris, this was, who does four days a week, his undulating programming looks like, looks like this, where he has a more, a strength, sort of strength-based day, traditionally strength-based day, followed by a more hypertrophy-based day to, for exactly the same reason what he said. Whereas now we're looking at, Lacking, lagging body parts. So now we're in a, in a build phase and I use it in terms of 
for his chest, we have, he does chest three days a week and we do a low rep range, a mid rep range and then a high rep range spread throughout the week. Um, and then everything else is basically built around that. And at the same time, we, he'll have like low reps on his back, mid to high reps on his back, but he only does them twice a week. So the frequency is a little bit lower on his non-specific parts, on his non-specialized body parts, but overall, the reps are still undulating to account for recovery, fatigue management, easy on his joints. So I'm not getting in, in, too, much pre in too much heavy pressing on the same day. And let's just take a little load of his elbows and shoulders at the same time. Got it. So I know there might be a question on this. I'm looking. <laughs> Um, no, so I'm, what I'm thinking, like basically you're saying it's more just to manage his fatigue, his joints, everything like that. Yeah. Why are you using... Correct. But there's also a lot of research showing that you will get a lot of, get a, you will build muscle throughout a variance of rep ranges. Yes. So, as, and it's not necessarily that, the thing I suppose with daily under periodization where people get it, I feel they get it wrong, is they, again, techniques and principles. They focus on the technique of daily undulating periodization and they read someone's daily undulating periodization plan online and they're like, well, I'm gonna do that with my client. Except your client's a beast. And you know, instead of needing a rest every second day, they need a rest every four weeks, say for example. They need every, every three, three or whatever. Maybe it's too much for them. They need a rest, they need to go high, low, high, low. It's the principle behind how you're using the daily undulated periodization, which is the whole factor of how to actually use it. It's about reading the client. So in saying that, if you get a client who trains like they're smoking weed twice a week, you don't need to worry about daily undulated periodization because they don't have the intensity that's gonna cure enough fatigue. If you get a beast of a client and they're really going for it every single time they come in and they're like coming to workouts, as I said to you the, the, the other day about, you know, I had fetters come in and they'd be like, oh, and I'd purposely get them to the point where I wanted to see them depressed to then pull back all their training, give them heaps of food and help them super compensate because it was part of the plan. They're the things that you need to read as a coach is you're, you're reading the client. So that's why I like the term fatigue management plan rather than uh, or recovery management plan or adaptation plan rather than daily undulated periodization because one implies the technique and the other one implies the principle behind how you're going to use that technique. Does that answer you, give you more clarity? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Say I left a bit unsure. Yeah, now, now we, we yeah. slam dunk. Uh, you had something to add? I don't have it now. Okay. I was, uh, yeah, so just back out your point, you're not giving, as your, your best saying was you wouldn't give it to a care bear. No, you wouldn't give it to a care bear. Care you wouldn't give it to a care bear, right? Yeah, you wouldn't give it to a care bear. Care, care bears, you, you need, some of these techniques, you need to earn the rights, right? A lot of people have not earned the right. And for most of the clients that come in for the first time, you're not gonna be able to show off special roundhouse spinning back kick off the diving board. You're gonna do a jump and they're gonna get really proficient to a jump. And then if they're lucky, they're gonna do a jump with maybe a clap <laughs> and that's it. And that's like, whoa, that's pretty special, right? Um, you, you gotta earn the right to, to be able to do the backflips and, and all that type of stuff. So I just wanted to uh, switch gears a little bit from clients. Were there any questions about Chris? You guys are understanding the programming because that was one of the big concerns that a lot of you said at the start of this course, you wanted to understand more about programming. We've got a real example. Actually, before we do move on from Chris, can we have a look at the last three phases? Now it's time is is pre comp, and he's you know pre you want pre comp yeah he's he's what like sub ten percent mm. we need to get him from ten percent to five percent or whatever it is we need to get him shredded he needs to go from lean to shredded because there's a difference between overweight obese overweight a little bit chubby uh, lean and then from lean to shredded these are all different phases right so. How do we get someone from lean, looks good, already looks good, but now we need to get him to compete. So this was second last phase before comp. Second last phase. Yeah. So can you talk us through the rep ranges, the sets? It's actually, <laughs> there's not much different in terms of, the only difference here is I look at a return on investment for the big compound movements. So if you look here, there's actually, Chris was deadlifting and I'm pretty sure usually within that either last or second last phase, I might pull something like deadlifts and back squats out. Um, and that's basically because the return on investment, um, I feel, is too low. Uh, so they're depleted, they're leaner, um, focus in the gym um, and concentration is at a bit, is a bit lower. Um, so sometimes the risk from injury is a bit higher. So you can see here with Chris, I got him hack squatting instead. Especially with hack squat, if I wanted to use that in a high rep range, I'm taking out that stability factor 
right? So he can actually still train closer to failure. So, so what we're talking about again is you're removing movements that require a higher degree of skill and replacing the movements that have inbuilt stability, which have a lower skill. Because again, it's a front squat in this case is a higher skill demand than a hack squat. Put him on the hack squat, which is then safer for him to go to failure. Yeah. Yeah. So lo lower skill work, but still compound in nature. So like a hack squat is still compound in nature. It's mm -hmm. not a technically like you'd say compound. It's not like one of the big three, but it's it's still it's a big squat movement. It's a big squat movement. It's bilateral. It's going to create a lot of uh, muscle damage, but it does remove the stability element from the piece. Yeah. And I still had him. Um, so you see here, he still had like a, a higher rep day, followed by a lower rep day, and then he had a rest and he had a low, low higher rep days again. So it was very much similar. And these last phase before comp was actually everything, I brought, pulled everything back. So you can see here, so uh, hack squat was the main movement, bench press and one arm rows. I pulled him back to a trap bar deadlift rather than a conventional barbell deadlift. And that was touch and go. Because again, the return on investment is quite low. And I wanna, he was like 5% here. Like between, yeah, you know, 4% and he started this one at like 8% and got down to 4%. So yes, we're still trained to failure. He was always trained to fail or as close to proximity to failure as, as he can. There was no change in intensity, but the selection of exercises that we used was, that was a lot different. Now, uh, we will switch gears here, I think is a good time, is, because I know this is a question that people are gonna ask or at least think about it, is, he's a dude. Any differences between training a female or how you think about this process for a female or are there any magic exercises or magic foods or magic macros that the differences between male and female or is it the same shit, different personality? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I kind of set you up with that question. Yeah, pretty much. For females, so like in that sense, would you train their like would be training their chest as much, would you say? Or? So just to repeat for the audio, would you be training their chest as much? Um, like, as an example, like, or would you more be like focused? I guess it depends on the lagging body parts when you get to that stage. Depends. So for, for, so for comp, for instance, so that is the only difference in in how I would train somebody where, um, so female, you're looking for that X frame more so, and then you're going to be judged more on, so basically, the guys joke out here where they see me do, so it's like a back glutes and delts. Right, that's which is your classic that's female fa female yeah. bikini fitness split, and then you throw some hams and, and quads yeah. in there. So yes, they don't really train as much chest because they don't need to. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the key of understanding principles, right? So the the techniques, if you just went with techniques, it's like, oh, this is what you do. But the principle is, we're going to prioritize the body parts that we want to grow. We're going to undulate the body parts or manage the fatigue of the person in general. Um, but really it's the prioritization of like if someone, Chris has a lagging chest, it's his body part of lagging arms, we're gonna prioritize that, train it three times a week. For female, like Janet, for example, when I was you know, coaching her, it was legs and back. It's really, all we did was legs and back. Um, that was probably 60 to 70% of her programming, legs and back. And her arm day was her active recovery day. And it was that when I snuck in, in between all her hard days because she still felt like she was working out and doing something and got that stimulus, but it wasn't really a big factor for her. It wasn't the hardest day of the week, right? So, you were gonna say? Yeah, but in, in saying that, like for gen pop females, I still get them to train chest. They still do bench pressing, incline, because it helps with everyday movement as well. They're, they're not uh, comp specific where we need to focus on lagging body parts or sculpt their body to a certain parameter and criteria. It's there for everyday life. What advice, like so having now coached quite a number of really top-notch, high-end body transformations, the coaches in the room, you know, they're wanting to get similar results for their clients. What words, I suppose, of advice, tips? You know, it's never, it's never a magic bullet, but a thousand golden BBs, if that makes sense. That's a good one. Like yeah. It. Um, it's good. What, what, what golden BBs do you have for the, for the crew? Um, it's work with the client, don't be a dictator. Work with the client, don't be a dictator. It's not a dictatorship. In saying that, there are some times when you need to go like full dictator and just be like, no, this is the way we're doing it. But at the same time, there's gonna be, you, you need to work with the client, you need to understand what is gonna keep them compliant and keep them on track. So for instance, I had one client who, <laughs> I actually, we, she was buying a singular Kinder Surprise every day on the way home from work because she wanted chocolate, but couldn't have a block of chocolate in the house. So I said, okay, every day on the way home, you buy one and a Kinder Surprise is her favorite chocolate. No, she's not 12, she's actually 30 years old. 
She's a really good client now. Um, but she would go, I said, okay, you pick a spot, you buy one of Kinder Supplies on the way home. And I would work it in. But the rest of it was on. But then they kept it compliant. And she's still with me four years later. Whereas Chris, we said, okay, can you try two squares of dark chocolate? And he ate the whole block. And I was like, okay, no more for you. That's it. And that's, that, that's the difference. <laughs> like, and this is where, even with nutritional changes, you know, Mark said, where, where did you change things and how did you change it? I asked them first. And uh, with nutrition, nutrition is a do with process, not a do for. Do two. Do two. At least you're going to quote oh, me, get my quotes right, yeah? You think I would have known this, but I've been here long enough. Nutrition is a, do with, is a do with process, not a do to process. Yeah. Do I two. just wanted to add, because we were talking about this the other day, notice Tyrone's language, right? Just to, to back up everything that you're saying, is Tyrone leads with empathy and he backs up with what? Authority. authority. Leads with empathy, he's backing up with authority. You heard the word there, collaboration. He collaborates with his clients. How does this chocolate work for you? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. I'm also now the authority to say we're not putting chocolate in your plan. I listened to your concern. This actually makes everything worse. We're not doing this because you've employed me to get you a result. And as you're in my care, this is not going to give you the result that you've employed me for. So as the authority on the topic, we're going to take it out. But I listened to your concern. Let's try and find another alternative that works with you. Oh, well, Kinder Surprise works. That's amazing. How can we include this? Okay, great. Let's include this. Four years later, see it's a collaboration. He's listening to the client. It's not the dictatorship of you have to do it this way. This is your macros. These are your concerns. I hear what your concerns are. These are some. This is how we can solve it. Did it solve it? Yes or no? Kind of pie chart or uh, linear graph. Yes, it did. No, it didn't. But constantly, it's that reiteration process. I think that's also a case of giving enough rope, but then pulling it back when it gets out of hand too. So, like, the difference between you know, I'm sure at some point we've probably been asked what's the difference between giving a meal plan and giving macros. Now, some clients might start with a meal plan and then as they want to change it, it's like, okay, let's introduce some macros and you can have a bit of freedom. Then that freedom gets out of hand and they're eating, you know, Sultana brand three times a day rather than rice and potatoes and getting no, no, no nutrients. And it's like, okay, you've just, you've, you've, we're gonna, let's, just, let's just pull it back in a little bit because you're getting a little bit out of hand. Yeah, so in, in, in chapter four of my book where I talk about flexible structure, you have macros, which can then feel like some people, macros feel like a prison. Food plans can feel like a prison. And so like, if it fits your macros, can feel like playing with Play-Doh, it can become anything, but then it's like, it becomes anything. So it's like, what's the, what's the alternative? Do we have this prison of iron bars where you have to eat 100 grams of rice with 100 grams of chicken with 100 grams of broccoli four times a day, and if you don't do that, the world's gonna explode, and you have to eat like this, which is a prison, or I can play with Play-Doh and make everything fit my macros, there is an in-between, bamboo. Bamboo is flexible, but it's also strong. So when we create the plans, we want to have this flexible structure. Two things can be true. Flexible structure with your clients of giving them that parameters yeah. to then make decisions. So they're not going to fall. If they do fall, they're not going to fall as far. If they're taking the piss, you pull them back in, basically. And that's where you become that authority for you as well. You go, you just get a little bit too far here. And that's where I will give... You asked me before on in the build phase where we'll give some you know, some processed foods. It's like I'll give you a little bit of rope. If you start to hang yourself, I'm going to come and save you because Yay. I'll just pull it back in. Yeah, <laughs> you'd hope so. <laughs> and that's and that's where you know Tom asked to go. Do I have a, a ratio of lean mass to body fat to put on? No, but if I find you putting on body fat too fast, I'll be like, why is this happening? Either I put your calories too high, or you're taking the piss with the food choices. And if you're taking the piss with the food choices, then I'm going to take charge and we're going back to a food plan. Personally, I like chronometer and chronometer, C R O N O M E T E R. Maybe we can get a sponsorship. Say, look, watch this. Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, <laughs> be nice. Uh, um, the reason why I like chronometer is because the, the issue with, between chronometer and, and my fitness pal is my fitness pal isn't as regulated. Mm. So anybody can put anything on there. You want to put you having like you can put chicken breast in, and you'll get 128 calories and 28 grams of protein, and you'll get three grams of protein, four grams of fat, and whatever. So people, it's it's very easy manipulated and it's not as regulated. Whereas with chronometer, everything. So basically, if you want to put, you want to submit a food, you need to send a photo of the nutrition label and the packaging label at the same time, and. It, I've done it, it takes like three months until it gets put on the system. Really? Yeah, and you get an email. Yeah. So it's a bit more regulated, plus it still has a barcode reader that you don't have to pay for. 
um, and also it gives you a breakdown of uh, micronutrients. So for someone in, so for comp prep, for instance, I will look at sodium potassium ratio and basically I'll just get their chronometer rating, uh, the, the readings on their chronometer, excuse me that. And then you can look at a micronutrient perspective. So it breaks down all the micronutrients in the food as well. So that's, that's what I prefer. And the transition that it looks like for me will be, here's your meal plan. Here's your calories and macros at the bottom. You're gonna put everything in day to day. And this is your guide. You can, and then you will learn to make changes and as you see fit and you will start to learn what is high, what, is, what carbohydrates look like, where your sneaky little fats are coming from, because people won't realize, you know, where fats come from. It's like, oh, I had a yogurt muesli bite, it's carbs, <laughs> but it's got 15 grams of fat because it's dipped in yogurt and chocolate, right? Uh, and they go, oh my God, I didn't realize. So yeah, and that's right. where the education comes from at the same time. Well, with that, let's give Tyrone a thunderous round of applause. Thank you, good lad. Thank you. Great.